will testing tell me what one of these diets is best for me to do? And the answer here is no. It's really important that you understand this, but let's go over some of the data. The gut microbiota is truly an amazing organ, this world of bacteria that live inside of your intestinal tract and modulate numerous functions regarding absorption of nutrients, inflammation, the immune system, and because of that, have far-reaching effects, including your brain, cognition, and mood, your endocrine function, thyroid hormone, and adrenal hormones, and even sex hormones, your skin, your liver, your muscles, your bone, your metabolism, and of course, your digestive function. Let's break down what diets are best for the microbiota while also being careful to not get swept away in academics and lose sight of the fact that some of you have likely tried to experiment with foods that are good for your microbiota and noticed they make you feel worse. And we can reconcile this when we combine some of the academic literature along with, importantly, some of the clinical findings, and we'll do that today. Hi, this is Dr. Michael Ruscio. I am a practicing clinician, a clinical researcher, and a adjunct professor at the University of Bridgeport. The gut is my main area of focus, and I'm very excited to detail a number of findings with you today, starting off with a schematic that really shows us the far-reaching impact that your gut has on all these various systems of your body. If there's one lever that we could pull on to improve your health, I think the most efficient lever would be your gut. Not to say it's the only thing to worry about, but gosh, look at this paper from Frontiers in Microbiology. As I said a moment ago, there are connections between your gut and the brain, the heart, the lungs, bones, muscles, reproduction, your bladder, your kidneys, your skin, your pancreas, your liver, and your endocrine system. Let's start off with this really fascinating study. Probably don't need to sell you on the fact that westernized diets are not healthy diets. But look at this study published in Cell. They tracked Asian immigrants, and when they moved to the US, they found they gained weight, and concomitantly, their gut microbiota dwindled and became less diverse. So we know that there's something deleterious about your diet and how that impacts your gut microbiota, and this correlates with things like metabolism. So the question then follows, well, what can we do? What I wanna walk you through are different dietary patterns that can improve your health and improve your microbiota. And why I think dietary patterns are helpful is because you wanna get away from this vilification of one food stuff. You know, Carbs are bad, gluten is bad, dairy is bad, um, what have you. It leads to kind of an erotic way of looking at one's diet. But if we can empower you with a plan, generally eat like this, don't sweat the small stuff, generally follow this plan and you'll do well. This is much easier, much more effective. So we'll cover briefly the Western diet and then look at really four main dietary patterns, paleo, Mediterranean, vegetarian, and low FODMAP, with an accent of fermented foods. There was a study published in PLUS One. These researchers wanted to look at what would happen to Italians eating a Mediterranean diet if they then shifted to a modified paleo diet. And I'm sharing on the screen here a schematic, but I'll also break down for those who are just listening what they found. What you're seeing is a Simpson and a Shannon index, essentially signatures of the gut microbiota. Now, the Italians eating their baseline Mediterranean diet had a certain distinct signature. That's what you're seeing in blue. When they went on a modified paleo diet, things shifted. Well, okay. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, this is the elegant part of the study. They looked at the shift from a Mediterranean diet onto a modified paleo diet next to the microbiota signatures of hunter-gatherers, Inuits, Matses, and Hadza. And again, what you can see in this depiction 
is when going from a Mediterranean diet to a modified paleo diet, the microbiota looked much more like the hunter-gatherer groups, leading them to conclude our findings suggest that a modified paleo diet could be a means to counteract the risk of losing bacterial memory that has accompanied our, uh, our ancestors through human evolutionary history. We can promote a healthy microbiota by consuming carbs from plant sources instead of from grains and reducing refined sugars and processed foods. So this seems reasonable. It seems reasonable to reduce processed food and sugar. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Reduction of grains and increasing the level of plants in one's diet. Pretty reasonable advice that you would hit with a modified paleo diet and also likely a Mediterranean diet. If you were coming from a standard American diet to a Mediterranean diet, you'd likely see an improvement in plants, even though there's some grains allowed in the Mediterranean diet. When this quote about increasing plant consumption is looked at in isolation, it can be taken out of context. And so I wanted to touch on the vegetarian diet. And in this review, they essentially found there was no difference in the microbiota of those who are omnivorous as compared to those who are vegetarian. And why this is important is because we don't want to mistakenly conflate the fact that increasing plants is good to then mean you must be plant-based or vegetarian. Now, one of the other findings that sort of leads to and feeds this, what I would say, myth that you have to be plant-based and you know, no overt opposition to it, but I, I wanna try to give you the facts so you can make an informed decision and not feel like you're shoehorned into a certain diet, especially when considering that for those with sensitive digestion, they may notice overly consuming plant foods can flare bloating, constipation, and diarrhea. So yes, we do wanna improve food quality and have a diverse intake of plants, but we don't want to do this somewhat vacuously and think that more is better even when it's not feeling good to you and you have the sense that it's flaring your digestive symptoms. In this data from American Gut, what they found was those who consumed a broader diversity of plant foods also had a higher diversity in their gut microbiota. Great. But they did not find that there was any difference between those who were vegetarian and those who were omnivorous meaning it didn't matter if you were eating meat and plants or just plants. What did matter was the diversity of plants in your diet. This is why I think we can look at a paleo diet or a Mediterranean diet and not fall into the mistake and think that you must be plant-based. Again, I'm not picking on plant-based, but for those who don't do well on that sort of diet, I want to try and countervail some of what seems to be uh, slightly cherry-picked citations regarding plant-based dieting. So this enters the Mediterranean diet and probably not surprising to see from this meta-analysis and nutrients that those who ate a Mediterranean diet had enrichment in the levels of beneficial bacteria in their gut. And again, this is likely because multiple diets can be health promoting. So to try to sum this down, what are a few starting steps? Well, firstly, improve your diet quality, reduce sugar, reduce processed food, eat more plants and eat less grain. Again, it doesn't mean you have to be grain free. It doesn't mean you have to be plant based. And you can look at diet patterns of paleo or kind of a relaxed modified paleo, Mediterranean or plant based, depending on your preference, and your needs. These will all move you in a healthy direction. Now, perhaps paleo is the best. I don't know that that is a fully defensible statement that one study looking at the Italians shifting from a Mediterranean diet to a modified paleo diet is interesting. 
But again, I think the more important thing is what you notice you feel best on. And this is kind of the recurring theme we should keep returning to, which is if a diet doesn't feel good to you, if you notice you're more constipated or you're more bloated or you don't sleep well, then we want to honor that. And rather than force you into one diet, look at the diets on offer, pick the one that feels best to you. So this begs the question, what's the best diet for the gut microbiota? And this is likely why review papers are commenting, as I'll quote here, there is not a unique optimal microbiota composition since it is different for each individual. This poses then the question, well, can we test? Will testing tell me what one of these diets is best for me to do? And the answer here is no. It's really important that you understand this, but let's go over some of the data which has shifted my opinion on this. Over the past five years or so, in clinical practice, I've gone from doing two stool tests on each individual to almost no testing. And this one data point regarding U-Biome charged with healthcare fraud underlies why I've shifted. Now, U-Biome was all the rage for years, allowing people to sequence their microbiota. And they then gave recommendations, eat this, avoid that, based upon your microbiota signature. Turns out they were lying. They were actually using in part dog feces to establish what the normative ranges for humans should be. So that's one. This other review paper from Nutrients essentially has concluded that there is no microbiota signature, so there's no stool test result that can tell you the best diet for optimizing metabolism or for improving your IBS symptoms. So whether you're trying to lose weight and optimize body composition, or you're trying to reduce gastrointestinal symptoms as seen as IBS, there's no baseline microbiota stool test result that can inform what diet to use. Well, what about a SIBO breath test? Perhaps you've heard of SIBO, SIBO breath testing. It's a valid test. However, as this randomized control trial found, your baseline levels of SIBO gases, hydrogen and methane, did not predict responsiveness to a low FODMAP diet. What did? Someone's symptoms. The more symptomatic somebody was, the more benefit they would receive from a low FODMAP diet. Hence, part of my position, which we'll come to in a moment in terms of what to do specifically if you have digestive symptoms, gas, bloating, constipation, reflux, pain. But one more study I want to equip you with, because this concept of not getting pulled into testing is so crucially important. We see patients waste thousands of dollars on testing to no avail. In this network meta-analysis, they found that IgG food allergy testing was no more effective than a normal healthy diet for improving IBS symptoms. It's crucially important to understand this. So tying some of this together for you, if you have digestive symptoms, then we can consider an elimination diet that removes foods that are commonly problematic for people. Gluten is one. However, we have to be careful with gluten because the prevalence of non-celiac gluten sensitivity is between 0.3 and maybe as much as 10% of the population. So there is a cohort of people, but it's not everyone. And I think it's a real misnomer to represent gluten as a problem for everyone everywhere all the time. It's just not with the data support. Maybe 10% of people eliminate, reintroduce. If you feel better off it and worse on it, okay. But don't avoid based upon faith. Another option would be the low FODMAP diet. And this brings us to a concept of perhaps less is more in terms of if you're looking to improve your gut health, it may not be a good idea to just feed your bacteria, put more fiber and more prebiotics into your gut. And this is evidenced by um, this meta-analysis, I'm sorry, this randomized control trial 
they had patients with digestive symptoms go on a low FODMAP diet, a gluten-free diet, and a Mediterranean diet. They found all were helpful, but the low FODMAP diet led to the highest level of symptomatic improvement. Now, full disclosure, there was a highest adherence, the highest acceptance with a Mediterranean diet. So what this tells me at least is if you're symptomatic, you can start with maybe four weeks on a low FODMAP diet. This should lead to the best resolution of symptoms. And then from there, reintroduce perhaps to a Mediterranean diet. If you prefer, you could go to a paleo diet or even a plant-based diet, again, depending on your preference, but starting with this less is more concept, bringing up a key point that pro-bacterial diets don't always lead, I'm sorry, don't always lead to improvements of the microbiota. So the, the most pro-bacterial diets aren't always the best. Now, this ties into the question of, well, don't I need fiber? Isn't fiber important for my gut microbiota? And the answer is yes, it is, but it doesn't mean that more is better. There may be a balance point or a Goldilocks zone, if you will. And that's depicted by this review paper in Nat uh, Nature Reviews in Gastroenterology and Hepatology, essentially saying there's a lot of questions regarding fiber, the types, the dosages to use for disease prevention and for gut health optimization. And part of what underlies that is probably the fact that not everyone does well on a very high fiber diet. In fact, for some people, it can actively make them worse. So we just want to avoid being absolutist with how we're thinking about the use of fiber. This also brings up the question, well, doesn't fiber help with metabolism? Don't I need fiber in order to have a healthy weight? And this meta-analysis found that fiber did not provide clinically meaningful weight loss. They examined 62 clinical trials in just under 4,000 participants. So again, it's not to say that fiber doesn't matter, but we wanna be careful to distinguish that more fiber is not better. And especially if you notice a higher fiber intake consistently leads to a flaring of symptoms, then you may wanna back off. I should also mention that during the first perhaps one or two weeks, as your gut microbiota is adjusting, you may notice some gas, some bloating, larger bowels, being a little bit constipated, that's transient. So be cautious not to jump ship too soon, but if you're noticing perpetual symptoms that last beyond say two weeks, then you may wanna pivot your diet to a more moderate fiber intake. And one other point I wanna make is that for regularity, specifically for constipation, it's not all about fiber. Again, the same concept. Now, there are good data showing that fiber can help constipation, but not everyone is helped from fiber regarding their constipation. Some people are made worse. Now, we know that about 75% of those with constipation report early life traumatic events. This is probably why other clinical trials have found that cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness can improve IBS symptoms, including constipation. Again, the concept here is it's not all about just forcing fiber into your gut. You can try it. If it goes well, great. Listen to your body. Your body is boss. However, if you've done that and it hasn't gone well and you've had traumatic events in your childhood, then the path for you might be this brain to gut path using CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or mindfulness. One of the most important concepts here is there's no love for the small intestine. Now, why does this matter? Well, as this review paper in gut concluded, and I'll quote for you, it is important to note that we can live without a colon, but not without a small intestine. You can live without a colon, without a large intestine. You cannot live without a small intestine. And part of the reason for this or reasons for this is the small intestine has the largest surface area in the entire intestinal tract, which is why 
It absorbs the majority of nutrients and calories. We're talking 90 to 95% of your calories and nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. The small intestine also contains the most gut receptors, the most immune receptors, and the most nerve cells. So think immune system, leaky gut, and motility. And this is also where in the small intestine, the highest degree of communication between your microbiota and the host, yourself, uh, occurs. So it's crucially important to understand while the gut microbiota is interesting, this is mainly assessing stool, which tells us about the colonic or the large intestinal microbiota. And it is not assessing 95% of caloric and nutrient absorption, the largest surface area of your intestinal tract and where most of the immune cells and therefore leaky gut or permeability occurs. And this is what reconciles part of, well, you want a diverse colonic microbiota, therefore feed it with bacteria, or, or I'm sorry, feed it with uh, prebiotics, which feed bacteria and fiber. But some of those diets actively make people worse. This is because it's not taking into account what's best for the small intestine. So this is how we reconcile some of these disparities. So enter the low FODMAP diet. This meta-analysis published in gut essentially found that for all of the symptoms studied, abdominal pain, abdominal bloating, distension, bowel regularity, for all of the symptoms that were measured, the low FODMAP diet ranked first. Now I should clarify, this is for those who have symptoms, but it's very likely if you're watching this and you care about the gut microbiota, you have some symptom you are trying to improve very likely digestive. We know that FGDs or functional gastrointestinal disorders affect about 40% of the US population. So there's a good chance that you have some digestive symptom. And if that's the case, you may not want to start with this sort of higher fiber diet. And this is where just keeping in mind a shorter term intervention on low FODMAP can really help to balance the microbiota, reduce symptoms, and then allow you to go to one of these diets that you prefer, whether it be paleo Mediterranean or plant-based. When discussing the low FODMAP diet, because this diet reduces the intake of prebiotics, what will sometimes occur is this confused conclusion that a low FODMAP diet will starve your intestinal bacteria. And this is not the case as this meta-analysis from 2022 concludes. The impacts of a low FODMAP diet are consolidated to bifidobacterium populations and do not affect negatively the colonic microbiota more broadly. In fact, I'll quote here, this should allay concerns about the safety of a short-term low FODMAP diet with regards to the colonic microenvironment. And again, this matters because it can lead to the low FODMAP diet that is such an improvement in symptoms. As we covered a moment ago, it was the most effective diet of all the diets studied for improving gastrointestinal symptoms. Now, what's more here is this fascinating and elegant review paper by Tarek Mazawi, who was on the podcast in 2018, and I really appreciate Tarek's work. What he found was that those undergoing a low FODMAP diet will actually see an improvement in the density of serotonin cells in the lining of their gut. Before a low FODMAP diet, as you see here on slide A, or slice A of the intestinal epithelium, there's a lower density of serotonin cells. After going on low FODMAP, the density of these very crucial neuroendocrine cells increases. Remember, serotonin regulates motility, pain reception, and may also have a spillover impact on mood. And you can improve the density of these very important cells by the less is more approach going on a lower, a lower FODMAP diet. Within this concept of less is more, fasting, this study found that either time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting both improved the firmicutes 
bacteroidetes ratio and increased populations of lactobacillus and archimancia. So again, this concept that less can be more for the gut. Again, why this is so crucial is for some, eating more fiber and prebiotics makes them worse. So we want to showcase the other side of the equation here. And zooming way out, you can undergo a higher fiber diet. But if that doesn't feel good, look at the utility of low FODMAP and intermittent fasting as two other tools that take this different tact of less is more for healing your gut and improving your microbiota. And then finally, no discussion on the microbiota would be fully complete without touching on fermented foods. And probably not a surprise to see this systematic review finding fermented food consumption significantly increased lactobacillus, bitter bacteria, and that these temporarily colonize the gut. And probably most important, this meta-analysis also in children, but or I should say in children, but finding that fermented foods reduced diarrhea and reduced their duration of hospital stays. I think it's reasonable to integrate fermented foods on a regular basis into your diet. And so this leads us back to kind of an action plan. What do you do? Well, first improve diet quality, reduce sugar and processed foods, eat more plants and less grain, consume fermented foods. Consider a diet plan that appeals to you. Paleo, Mediterranean, or plant-based are good starts. If you have digestive symptoms or you notice one of these diets flares you, start with an elimination diet. This takes out foods that are common culprits like gluten and dairy, being careful not to avoid those forever. And if that doesn't solve your problems, you may want to consider the less is more approach with a lower FODMAP diet and some intermittent fasting. And just remember that more fiber isn't always better and be wary of testing. Now we've hit a number of both direct and indirect supports for gut health. Prebiotics as contained in diet, diet directly, fiber, fasting, and stress as can be ameliorated by CBT or meditation. However, there's a number of other methods through which you can modulate the microbiota. Antibiotics, antimicrobials, sleep, exercise, and sun exposure. And we'll outline these and how you can use them and complement them in the next video. But if you are someone who's trying to improve your gut health, including your gut microbiota, I hope this provides you some clarity in terms of what you can do and how to navigate those options so that you don't end up eating in such a way that makes you feel worse, but you keep doing it because you read it was better for you. There's a few options. There's a little bit of a hierarchy here to follow. And if you do this the right way, you should notice that your gut symptoms are reduced. And you can also rest assured that if you're eating a high, moderate, or even lower fiber diet, as long as you're within one of these plans, you should be having a favorable impact on your gut microbiota. All right, guys, hope this helps. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.